Marcus and Maya come from two completely different tribes, two completely different regions of Ethiopia with distinct languages and cultures all their own. Maya comes from the Guragi region, a more fertile, green agricultural area than Marcus's. It's about three hours out from the city, and it's beautiful. Maya, it should be noted, left home at a much later age. There's no question of identity. She's African, she's Goragi, and she retains close ties to her family and to her village. Welcome to <laughs> Thank you. She was here just last year. It's been four years since they've seen Marcus. Maya's mother, Bazunesh, and de facto grandmother, Owl, welcome us. So it's like, go When visitors come, everything starts with coffee. Traditionally, it's served here with a bit of salt, not sugar. This is a very misunderstood country. Uh, for instance, did you know that you know Christianity was in Ethiopia like before Europe? That it's not a arid desert. That is in fact mostly green. And that there's a construction boom going on here that rivals China and Dubai. It's a country filled with great cooks. Great music. Ethiopia is absolutely unique, little understood. We're looking to uh, shed a little light. Nobody they do this good You have to. This, this stuffing of food into your fellow diner's face is called gersha, and it's what you do to show your affection and respect. Try this at the Waffle House sometime and prepare for awkwardness. Now, when you, you were born here? I was born here. Left yeah. what age? 13. I grew up in Holland, and after that, we all went to London, Germany, and I'm in New York now, so. I don't want to say it's a rootless existence, but, but it's a, you know, where's home? I think for us now, if Harlem is really home. But when I've been gone for two years, I'm like, I got to go back because the beat is just so different than what Sweden can offer me and definitely what New York can offer me. The median age in Ethiopia is under 18. That means most people here don't remember Live Aid or any of that. Coupled with a recent economic boom, this might be the first generation in decades to enjoy a future with real hope. Things are indeed happening. In this case, at a vacant bus stop. Like in rural communities, when you kill a big, you know, couple of animals, right? Everybody in the village has sort of a chosen specialty. Like Joe Bob over there, he does the, the uh, crackling. Somebody else over there does the boudin. Yeah. Somebody else over there is like good at the scraping the fur off. Somebody yeah. else, but, but everybody's got a function. You know, it uh, goes right back to the first fire. I mean, I'll bring the, I'll bring the dip. You know. Normally, you hold it like this, and then you have you put everything you want okay, in here. Cool. Got it. You guys could take some and then we're gonna take it around. Perfect. 
Goman and Ayib are greens, like collards, with a big hit of Berberet and Ayib cheese. Mm. I like the cheese. It's like a ricotta. <laughs> Lamb kitfu, prepared gurage style, laboriously diced, amazing. Uh, this is all like inner? Yeah, I got some of that. That's good. That's, that's delicious. Yeah. This I love without reservation. Barbecue, now we're talking. Man, what a meal. Pretty impressive. Then, whiskey. And music. And the party really starts going. Thank you for coming to Ethiopia. Addis Ababa capital city of Ethiopia, a cool, high-altitude urban center that will both confirm and confound expectations. Fueled largely by direct foreign investment and a returning Ethiopian diaspora eager to be part of the new growth, things are changing in Addis. It's one of the fastest growing economies in the world. Making film from Africa, now being recognized at festivals around the world. A way of life rarely presented for international audiences. We are in Ethiopia for the premiere of LAM, to meet the man behind it and to visit the land and people it portrays. Welcome to Addis Ababa. Welcome to Inside Africa. We begin in the French Riviera. At one of the most prestigious gatherings of filmmakers and film lovers in the world. The Cannes Film Festival. It's an annual showcase of some of the best in cinema. And of course, a media frenzy. As photographers swarm to get good shots of the brightest stars of our day. Amidst the commotion, an unlikely victory for Yared Zeleka, whose first feature film, Lam, is also the first film from Ethiopia to have won a coveted slot in the official selection at Cannes. It definitely was, was such, a, such a reward to be recognized on the world's biggest and brightest platform for, for your work. And um, it's a dream realized. Lam tells the story of a young Ethiopian boy, his four-legged best friend, Chuni, and Ephraim's scheme to save the sheep from slaughter. I wanted to convey a message of connectedness. So while this film is the first Ethiopian and it's unusual to see faces like mine on, um, or from that part of the world on, on the big screen in this type of arena, uh, I think ultimately people connected with, with, with some, of, some of the fundamental themes in the story. The protagonist A-Frame's um, struggle and fear and love and dream is like yours. The film is um, semi-autobiographical. So Months after the excitement of Cannes and almost 5,000 kilometers away, we catch up with Yared in his homeland. With no money, no budget. Where tonight his film debuts in Ethiopia at the National Theatre in Addis Ababa. It's really exciting, but it's, I'm most nervous because uh, this is my home country and, uh, you know, and so how an Ethiopian reacts to this film affects me the most because, uh, you know, it's my people and my country and, and I hope it, it will be as, as well received and people will connect to it the way people have abroad. And so I'm very, very nervous actually, um, but also really, uh, really happy to share this at home. The crowd fills the theater. I dedicate this screening to my beautiful and talented cast and crew 
Enjoy the fruits of your hard labor, and I love you very much. Okay, so that was the premiere night and uh, it seems to be a really good response from people and I'm just so happy that it's finally premiered in my home country. Uh, and also really tired, uh, but uh, so I need a little bit of honey wine edge. So I'm off to the reception. Before Ephraim, the boy protagonist of Lam, there was a young Yared who grew up in Addis Ababa. It was a pretty colorful childhood, very, very colorful. My grandmother, Tafa Zalega, that I'm named after, um, she was really known and revered in, in my neighborhood for her storytelling. At times, uh, you know, my grandmother would get into her stories and everybody would be completely mesmerized. And I remember sitting beside her, just listening. So I think my love of story um, in terms of listening and, 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 and reading and writing, I think it comes from, from that upbringing. So this is my childhood home where I was born and raised, and uh, where I also, I lived here for three years while working on this film, actually. You know, when I was a kid, this was like my kingdom. At the age of 10, Jared moved to the United States, which he describes as a sort of loss. I remember very distinctly the day I left. I, you know, there was like this heavy, this heaviness on my, this lump in my throat. And it was like beyond me. I just didn't understand. Why am I leaving my grandmother? Why am I leaving my family? Why am I leaving my country and my home? The Ethiopia Yared knew was a bustling place. The marketplace is like part of my upbringing. Uh, I had to incorporate that in the story. It was like these street kids and I used to watch like with kind of a, a fascination. Um, and they were like just like rougher and tougher than even, you know, that little neighborhood I'm from. So I definitely, uh, I have very like deep memory of uh, Mercato. Yared's love of storytelling and his home country would lead him to study film at New York University. Because I grew up in the US, people thinking Ethiopia is a desert. And well, I've never seen a desert here. Um, and so I, I'm, I'm, it's like, I'm gonna show the world the Ethiopia that I knew and remember and live in. So we are in the countryside now uh, because this is uh, very close to where my aunt's place is. And uh, every weekend I would come out to see her. It was an open field like this, but it is my favorite place. Most of Ethiopia looks like this, and uh, I think uh, I just felt a need to do a story uh, about the countryside and farm life because of this experience as a kid, coming out to these, to these really beautiful fields. When Yared came back to Ethiopia, some 20 years after he'd left, his beloved grandmother died, sparking in Yared an unshakable idea. When she passed away, I, um, I think that's when I really started to think about the story and started to, of course, to write. <laughs> it was a way of coping uh, with my loss. And so I just came up with the story of a kid 
leaving his home. And that story would premiere at the Cannes Film Festival. It, it, it's like one of the top best moments of my life, of course. And, you know, because it's not only, you know, about my career, but it's Ethiopia. And the home by Ethiopia, ye Christian Hamilton, Eslamanam, and this Abroba Salam and Demid Wazunam, and the home, science and Batamalakatam, Ethiopia, but a Ferdurri Aslam Tadago Murmur, CNN, Bessamon Uzagabau, and Dihiblual. You're fleeing persecution in Mecca, and over time, this city became a center of Islamic learning. Nowadays, uh, everything was changed. Uh, no, no, if, if you are uh, learning Arabic, if you are uh, writing Arabic, and, uh, but now it was reviving because everything, is, our culture is reviving. First you see a Coptic church, Madana Lem church. If you go 15 meters, not 15 kilometers, 15 meters you get great Jamia Mosque. If you go 20 meters, you can get Catholic Church. So that three of them live with peace in the coexist, uh, what do you call, intolerance. Respect each other, you see. We admire them, they admire us. We didn't touch them, they didn't touch us. We, 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 we go to the mosque, they go to the church. It is a paragon of religious coexistence, and in 2003 was awarded a Cities for Peace Prize by UNESCO. Most Ethiopian uh, cities, they are conflicted, but they tried it in Harar also. But the people are patient. We have a um, inter-religious committee in Addis Ababa and everywhere in, in the country. Uh, work together and support each other. So that's why, that's why, so thanks God we are living peacefully. Here in a 10th century mosque, young and old are bowing to pray. They practice a strand of Islam known as Sufism. Sufi uh, Islamic way is peaceful and uh, it is tolerance, you see, so that uh, uh, you, are not, you, you don't be aggressive. Back in the museum, Elias is continuing his work of restoration. The Sufis were not only influential in spreading Islam, they were also enlightened thinkers, scholars writing books on mathematics, medicine and astronomy. This book shows the sketches of astronomers in Ethiopia back in the 17th century. And today, in the hills outside the capital Addis Ababa, they are staring out into the same skies making new discoveries. It's really something enormous that you feel because from my early age, from my childhood, I was really interested in astronomy. And the second one is technology. So uh, starting with a telescope, doing such uh, research and getting engaged in such fields is a dream come true. You can say how much interested, how much happy I, I have been that these telescopes are being um, implemented in our observatory. The observatory currently has two one-meter telescopes and a small team conducting research. Among them is a Russian professor with experience of this work all over the world. The unique location of this observatory allows us to observe practically all sky with good coverage of northern and southern hemispheres. Of course, developing country cannot compete with these rich countries in these fields of astronomy. But uh, there are many unsolved problems in astronomy which don't require huge telescopes.
but they require huge amount of observing time. So we, we concentrate on such kind of projects. The program was launched by an independent organization, the Ethiopian Space Science Society, and its vision encompasses more than just the stars. The first object, the first one is to promote space science and astronomy. The second one is establish a, a good research center that can bring all Ethiopian universities and research centers to work together. And the third one is strong to make to be strong international collaboration. And finally, transforming science and technology to the country. Thus far, the project has cost approximately $5 million, put forward by members of the society and the Saudi-Ethiopian billionaire, Sheikh Mohammed al Amudi. But as the project expands to include more observatories and a satellite program, there's hope the government will offer support. Of course, Ethiopia is growing fastly, but that sustainable economy should be supported by technology. It should be supported by science, with strong support. We are renting satellites. If you go to the broadcasting center, we are renting satellites. Do you know how much dollars we have, how much millions of dollars we are paying? That, that, that's the secret thing that people may not know. So we have to revert this. The basic and important thing is Ethiopia has to have its own satellite in the coming five years. It's an ambitious plan, and along with the tools, it will need a talented team. In the center of Addis Ababa, young students from a range of secondary schools across the city have gathered to share their passion for science. My name is Miro McConan, I am 17 years old and I want to be a particle physicist. I want to know what I'm made of. I want to know what this everything is made of. I want to know what this astonishing universe is made of. My name is Demikhail Damto, I'm 16 years old. I want to be a rocket scientist. I love rocket science because First of all, when I was a child, I was dreaming to reach the stars. But these drawings are just a design of the objects that I have imagined. My dream is to see these types of designs into a real, into a real matter. To touch them, to see them, to be functional. My name is Dagam Teresa. I'm 13 years old and I want to be a robotic engineer. This is the boat which, which I made. I'm interested in physics and uh, inventing things in the field of invention. For these young people, there is no limit. And with a little support, it is they who will be building a bright future for Ethiopia. ኢትዮጵያችንን በተመለከተ ሲኤንኤን ስለ ታላቁ የመስቀል ባላችንና እንዲሁም ስለ ጃዝ ሙዚቃችን ሰሞኑን ባቀረቡ ዘገባ እንዲብሏል። The flames flicker against a sea of candlelights. Here in the central square of Ethiopia's capital, Addis Ababa, one of the oldest Christian communities in the world has gathered to celebrate a holy feast in the heart of a modern city. The Feast of Meskel commemorates the supposed discovery of a fragment of the crucifix of Christ in Ethiopia over 1,600 years ago. It also happens to fall at the end of the rainy season, so marks the beginning of spring. But these are not the only causes for celebration. With GDP up more than 10% last year, Ethiopia's economy is now ranked one of the five fastest growing in the world. But go back into the ancient past and you find the country has a store of riches of a different kind. It is home to nine UNESCO World Heritage Sites, among them holy places for Christians and Muslims. Scientists have called it the cradle of civilization, with the discovery of the first human species. And this year, the European Ministry for Tourism declared Ethiopia the world's best tourism destination for its natural beauty and cultural wonders. Addis Ababa Central Square is named after the annual Feast of Mescal. It has been celebrated here for nearly a century, and two years ago, UNESCO granted the event World Heritage Status. It gains momentum in the afternoon, 
with nearly 10,000 young people from parish churches around the city presenting songs and dances before an assembly of officials, including the head of the Ethiopian Orthodox Church, Abune Matthias. We are very happy, uh, not only in Addis Ababa, it is entire the country, celebrate uh, Mescal celebration. Mescal means the cross, the true cross. That's why we are uh, doing this, uh, because we respect the Holy Cross. The Patriarch is the leader of Ethiopia's over 45 million Orthodox Christians. As night falls, watched on by his followers, he steps out to perform the ritual of his forefathers, walking around the pyre three times, then setting it alight. The Orthodox faith is very strong, very strong and deeper um, in, uh, in the minds and the hearts of the people, and it continues strongly. It will continue stronger. It will continue with its uh, power, spiritual power. It will be uh, good for the country, for the people, because belief is good in God. And that's that's very, very, very important to people, to all the Ethiopia, Ethiopia and, and all to all the people of, in the world. There's one aspect of this tradition that resounds beyond the ritual. The echoey chants and drum beats have been carried through the generations and have come to define not just church music, but a new sound of music. Mulato Astatke is better known as the father of Ethio jazz. In the 1950s and 60s, he began to develop a style that fused traditional instruments and music notation with modern sounds and improvisation. He composed the soundtrack for the Oscar-nominated movie Broken Flowers and has performed on stages around the world, including Glastonbury Festival in the UK. The combination, the art, different sounds, makes it very Ethiopian and makes it sound really Ethiopian touch, Ethiopian feel. This is what it is. I think that's why I became very successful all over the world, because it sounds different. Astatke's development in what was popularly called the swinging 60s of Ethio jazz inspired others to adopt the sound and develop it. Addis Acoustic Project is a band, a six-piece band, that focuses on uh, Ethiopian music of the 1950s and early 1960s in particular. And I, I arranged uh, and rearranged these uh, Ethiopian classics from, from that era. It involves three generations, uh, the oldest being the mandolin player uh, and the singers uh, in their late 60s and early 70s, and, and the youngest, uh, the, the drummer in his late 20s, and the rest of us fall in between. <laughs> so it's three generations, and so is the audience, three generations. The roots of Giram Mesmer's inspiration lie many centuries back in the hands of a holy man. Yes, Saint Yaret uh, was a music composer in the Ethiopian Orthodox Church in the 4th century. He composed uh, all the Ethiopian uh, hymens uh, of the Orthodox Church. And, and to this day, that has direct and indirect influence on, on, the, on the culture. What we call Ethiopian jazz, it borrows a lot of elements uh, from jazz, but also includes the Ethiopian elements, the modes, uh, sometimes the instruments, uh, the, the way uh, the, the melodies are played, the way melodies are embellished, and so on. So there's an exotic element to it, and there's also the, the what we can say, accessible element to it, what the rest of the world is used to. There are a number of live bands nowadays, uh, some playing, uh, their own stuff, some playing with popular singers, some playing instrumental music. So it's so colorful nowadays. And the past 10, 15 years inc increasingly has, has witnessed this. I was uh, living in New York City and I was scared of leaving New York because it's such a great city for art and music and I was worried I wouldn't get the same stimulation other places. But uh, when I came here, surprisingly, the music scene was really thriving here in Addis. I met Groom, my friend, uh, who plays also in the band with us. 
and other musicians, and I thought that I could be happy playing and teaching here. The Ethiopian manner of performing uh, melodies is so particular. Immediately after a few notes, you'd know that it is Ethiopian. Once you listen to it, I think uh, it's, it's easy to fall in love with. While the traditional five-note melody gets fingers clicking in the jazz bars, switch it up, mix it up, and you get the sound driving devotees to the Addis nightclubs. It's a sound inspired by traditional Ethiopian music, uh, using music technology, music software, sampling, recording, sampling, synthesizers. And DJ producer Endegena Mulu is part of a small underground scene in Addis Ababa, boldly making a new sound built on tradition. The things I see is that most people, not just here in Ethiopia, all over the world are giving up traditions, like forgetting and letting go of things that have been passed down to them to embrace something that has been passed down to someone else. I know, I know what the language is, I know what those songs mean, and I mean, nobody can, can remember those traditions. If I don't preserve them, who will? منم انکوان بایکوت آدرگود یه تبعه بزو زمان چابی در رقت بتم یه گننم یه دگه سلامت آو یه توی پیاده من گرچنم سینین یه نیم ساله از دستاج زگبا اگر بولنال. This year we have posted a record profit in our history by 172 million dollars. But I would say it's a continuation of the success in our vision 2025. Uh, we just finished the first phase of uh, Vision 2025, the first five years, uh, from 2010 to 2015. And in general, uh, we are very satisfied with the results. We have exceeded all our parameters in uh, Vision 2025 for the first five years. And uh, the, the plan was to be the largest leading aviation group in Africa by 2025. But fortunately, by 2015 already, we are the largest uh, carrier today in Africa, whether by, uh, you measure it by fleet size or number of international destinations, uh, passengers, revenue, profit. Mm. Uh, so it means that we have achieved our uh, goal 10 years ahead of the plan. $172 million for this year. Correct me if I'm wrong, but that's more than all of the other African airlines combined. That's, that's true. So that's how the media puts it. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so what is the secret to your success? To begin with, it's a very low margin business. You know, uh, IATA has it that uh, in a good time, the airline margin is around 5%. It doesn't excess five, uh, exceed 5%. Right now, it's around 3%. So you have a very low margin business, and the cost of error is very high. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes fatal. And uh, so um, long term, Planning is a very, very important success factor. Uh, what it means there is we have planned for the next 15 years, both in terms of fleet, in terms of financing, in terms of infrastructure, human resource development, and systems. Uh, that puts you uh, in a solid foundation in the uh, competitive environment, in the competitive market. In Vision 2025, we aimed for an airline group or an aviation group of 10 billion US dollars by 2025. 10 billion annual revenue? Right now we are 2.4 billion US dollars. Uh, the second one is the ability to rally all the team, the about 9,000 uh, regular employees and 2,100 uh, uh, contract employees towards the same goal. So. Yeah. Uh, How do you manage that? That must be difficult. That's difficult, but uh, uh, it's, it's a corporate culture that we have uh, inherited for a long period of time. Going back to Vision 2025, you have plans to increase your fleet. Right. Uh, the Dreamliner being, uh, you know, one of your... The core, yeah. Yeah, one of the key uh, planes that you have. Initially had a few problems. Right. Was that a concern? And where are you now? The Dreamliner, uh, yeah, it's a very important part of our fleet. Uh, it's a core fleet today. We have 13 in uh, service and uh, eight on order. Uh, next year alone, we are going to receive six of them. 
Uh, as you said in the beginning, it was a challenge uh, for the industry and uh, Ethiopian Airlines included. We are among the first uh, operators of the 787, the first in Africa and second in the world next to Japan. And uh, yeah, we have shared uh, our technical problems that uh, prevailed in the airplane. Uh, but now the, the airplane has matured, the fleet has matured, it is doing very well. There's also a huge focus on cargo, how is that working out? What are the differences, what are the benefits? It's been a very challenging business for us for a long period of time. So we've been working together with the horticultural industry to develop horticulture export uh, from Ethiopia to Europe and the rest. Uh, that has paid a very good div dividend for both of us, for the airline and for the country. Today, Ethiopia is the second uh, in Africa in horticultural uh, export, particularly flower export. And uh, for us also, although it has been a loss making for a long period of time, uh, because we were focused on uh, developing cargo network, mm -hmm. uh, it has made us uh, the, the first in Africa today, the largest with uh, six 777 freighters in service, dedicated freighters, and two 757s. So we have eight dedicated uh, wide-body uh, freighters in the continent. We are the largest. What do you think needs to happen for African aviation to benefit as a whole? Uh, I want to see Africa um, aviation growing very fast in line with the economic development of the continent, putting all things together, Africa is going to be the next and last frontier in globalization. So it's going to grow very fast in the 21st century. But I don't see African aviation growing in according to the uh, growth economic development. And uh, this is a major concern. And you know, if you take the reality on the ground in the continent, road transport is underdeveloped, railway transport is underdeveloped. The terrain of the continent is really a challenge. So air transport is a key uh, essential public transport service. CNN Mitchin was to sell a low true nagger, Mazagabun, Bamakatel, Ethiopiachin, Kehud Ambassanet, with the economy Ambassanet, Bamalet, Bazior, Balakako.